Okay, uh, it should be live streaming. Maybe we can also close that. Is it possible? Um, uh, and maybe. Oops. Yeah. Let's just this. Okay. And of this, uh, we will now live streaming. Are you seeing? Hello, everyone. Welcome to. That was Mohammed, not me. Okay. All right. I guess people can hear me well. So if you cannot hear me well, just let me know. Uh, the speaker is on. Uh, yeah. And if you have any questions again, uh, you can speak up from Zoom or like, of course, from here. And welcome, everyone. And uh, today, <laughs> so we're going to our topic is, uh, is about genomics and like how we do genome analysis. So we're having this lecture because uh you you will have some papers uh and i assume the papers are not assigned to you yet in the seminar uh i think that's correct uh is that correct okay yeah. uh, because that's the purpose so you want to be in front with like different uh topics right and we had this lecture last semester as well but we had this lecture after the paper assignments were made and some students gave the feedback that actually if, that, if they had basically know what genomics is or what genome analysis is, they would have uh, picked. Uh, you cannot see my camera? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so you need still to get the... Uh, what should I do? Spotlight for everyone. Okay. That's good. And we can put it where? Maybe somewhere. Yeah. Like here? Yeah, okay. I guess. Maybe on here. Okay. Yeah, basically the feedback that maybe it will appear within a second. So let me know. And um, again, the feedback that we, uh, that we had is. Uh, the, the feedback that we had, okay. The feedback that we had is if uh, students had known about genomics before the paper assignments, they would have picked a genomics related paper. So that's why, yeah, like that's one of the reasons that's also we're having this lecture uh, today. Uh, so, yeah, then I'll start with brief self introduction of myself. I'm a PhD candidate in the software research group uh, led by Professor Nurmutlu. And my research interests are in the intersection of bioinformatics and uh, computer architecture. I'm interested in many uh, topics uh, related to those, for example, real-time analysis of genomics, um, similar to search, uh, again, in genomic data, hardware algorithm core design uh, to accelerate genome analysis, genome editing itself, and also error correction. Uh, where do I just know all these links uh, to our websites, group website? But these are also some of our uh, uh, some pointers to uh, to my personal email, also uh, my academic website. If you want to check more about my research, and uh, we have uh, three, four, four main agenda for today. I'll start with introduction to genomics. Uh, essentially, I'm going to show you how we analyze the genomes today, and also I'll try to describe what an intelligent genome analysis is. And then we'll move on to uh, uh, to some low level uh, step by step uh, how we do genome analysis in lower levels and how we accelerate these uh, steps. Uh, uh, um, and then we'll conclude with some future opportunities and some discussion points. Uh, so I usually like to start with uh, reminding the goal of computing uh, in in, the, in such lectures, and I do it usually by uh, showing this quote from Richard Hamming, which says the purpose of computing is is to gain insights, uh, not necessarily just numbers. So that's scientifically speaking, let's say, not maybe it's not usually the case for entertainment purposes, but for scientific uh, way of computing, that's usually the case. And today, actually, we need to gain insights and observations much more efficiently than before 
And one reason for that is basically because we have big data, right? So the data is growing uh, a lot. And uh, the big data is, of course, everywhere. It's, uh, you can see it in astronomy, social media, of course, uh, uh, AI ML applications, and, uh, and also in, in the entertainment sector, and also, of course, some important applications like uh, genomics. Uh, since the data is growing, but we still want to generate insights efficiently uh, from such a big data, um, uh, we efficiently we essentially need to uh, process this data um, efficiently also. However, the, the, the main uh, problem with the big data analysis or data analysis today is what we usually have is that in most cases, we have usually have this special purpose machine that is really specialized for data generation in a very fast way, let's say. So the goal of such a machine is usually not the computer data, but the generated data itself. Right? So you can think of sensors, you can think of, in this case, this is a sequencing machine that generates uh, genomic data. It takes a genomic sample and then generates the uh, digital uh, form of it. However, how we're trying to uh, analyze this data is essentially is by usually using general purpose machines, right? And this makes things slow because this machine is not necessarily designed to, to analyze uh, that special uh, 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 formatted data with special needs, right? And uh, of course, that special needs can mean uh, many things. Uh, but essentially, again, our goal is like in the science and art of uh, revealing previous unknown and potentially available information, right, from that data, and we may have certain goals by doing it. So our goal can be, for example, we may, we may not meet certain performance or latency requirements, or maybe there can be some energy consumption requirements, so we may need to do the computation power efficient, or maybe it can be monetary costs, right? And your general purpose machine is not going to, of course, achieve all of these altogether. And it won't know your goals, right? Depending on the data that you're analyzing or application. And then, of course, we want that intelligent uh, data analysis tailored for uh, important applications, for example, AI, ML, genomics, medicine, and, and health, and so on. So, if you remember from the previous lectures, I guess we've showed you uh, some four key directions in our research group. and. Uh, one of these, uh, these key directions is essentially building architectures for AI ML, like important applications, uh, ML, genomics, medicine, and health. So I'm going to be, again, as I said, uh, mainly focusing on the, the genomics part of, of, of that uh, direction. So uh, general statement is that we really need faster, scalable, and accurate genome analysis because doing so is very important for many reasons. For example, it is really important for understanding genetic variations, species, evolution, and so on. It is also important for predicting the presence or re relative abundance of, uh, of microbes or organisms in a particular sample, right? For example, it could be a certain viral genome where it is present or not in a certain environment. And this can be really handy for, of course, rapid surveillance of disease outbreaks, like the one that we had experienced, we just experienced like a few years ago with COVID, right? And uh, the other uh, 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 good reason, in my opinion, is, of course, developing personalized medicine. So if you could understand each individual's genome by analyzing it, you could maybe prescribe uh, 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 drugs, specialized drugs for that uh, individual uh, so that it works even much uh, better. And of course, we have many, many other applications in, in, in genomics. So then what is a genome? So we keep saying genome analysis or genomics, but then uh, what is a genome, right? Because it makes almost each of us uh, look different, maybe behave different, also have different traits, symptoms, and so on, right? So the genome is essentially, it's, uh, hopefully we have a genome, each of us, because we have uh, many, many cells, and in each of these cells we have these, let's say, uh, little, let's say, weird, shaped uh, strings, right? So these are essentially within your cell, it's in your nucleus. So this is called uh, DNA, let's say. So you're seeing a part of DNA over there. And if if basically we're talking about a human cell over here, what we usually have is a 23 uh, pairs of, uh, of chromosomes within, within the nucleus. And of course, we have also mitochondrial DNA outside of nucleus as well. But when you digitize that DNA, it usually looks like this, right? It's a bunch of 
ACTGs, and that's what we want to analyze somehow. Uh, but let's say going back to just scale things a bit uh, better, uh, maybe I can start by asking the question that I usually ask. Uh, do you know uh, which building this is or uh, where this is located at? Of course, like some people here already know, <laughs> I'm looking at a special of you perhaps in that case. <laughs> I'll be there, uh, I guess, uh, so shortly. If more yeah. more, there some people from Zoom, if they want to shout out. Um, okay, but this is uh, one of the hours in Zurich, right? So it's Andreas' tomb. And, and this is uh, around, uh, I guess, 50 meters or 60 meters long uh, building and in Orlikon. So what would happen is that if you sequenced uh, uh, your any three pairs of chromosomes within the single nucleus uh, of your human genome, not entire all your cells, but a single nucleus. And then you essentially write your own letter uh, one by one in a piece of paper, right? Uh, when you reach the end of your uh, genome, the number of papers, and then if you pile them together, the length of that. Uh, pyro would be essentially larger than the Andreas Sturm itself. And this is just a single, uh, uh, this is coming from a single nucleus of your uh, 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 single cell, let's say, because it includes around 3.2 billion uh, genomic characters. And so you can just think of the scale or amount of information in an exaggerated way, of course. And if you are curious how I did the math, it's over here. The condition so you can check it later the math checks out uh, but essentially since this is really important to be able to analyze the human genome of course especially so that we can understand a bit ourselves a bit uh, the diseases that uh, people suffer uh, uh, back in the 1990s there was this human genome project the goal was to be able to build the, the human genome in the digital form uh, entirely and, uh, uh, you know, as I said, the, the human genome itself is huge. It's around uh, three, it includes around 3.2 billion, 3.3 billion bases of characters, right? Uh, when I say bases, it's essentially one of ACTGs, right? And it took around uh, 30 years to finish, and it costed more than 3 billion uh, US dollars to complete that entire project. Although it was extremely, of course, useful and it led to many scientific discoveries later on, uh, you can see essentially how much effort and how much uh, resources were spent just to build that uh, single uh, finished, finished, let's say, uh, 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 genome. But then uh, we realized or, or like we knew that that genome wasn't really complete, right? So it's included some missing parts because it, back then it was really challenging to essentially read out the entire genome and then load up the entire piece uh, without any gaps and any errors and so on. And as the technologies and algorithms improved uh, uh, three years ago, these individuals, but of course this is not just these individuals, the paper behind it includes uh, other, of course authors, but these are the last four authors of that paper realized again more complete version of the human genome and they were recognized as one of the most hundred most influ influential people of 2022 uh, by by time so you can see essentially the the impact of of uh, such an information right so when you have the human genome in the world and when it becomes even more complete the impact of it is really significant because uh, and this means that we can actually uh, uh, you the information that wasn't known before so that we can understand the diseases and solutions to those diseases even um, in a better or accurate way. Uh, so we've been focusing on the human genome a lot, so then what about the other species, right? So uh, what about the sizes of the other species? So this is uh, a, a viral genome, is a, a virus, and uh, its length, the number of bases that it includes in a genome is around 5.3 thousand uh, bases. It's relatively small than the human genome. So if I look at a bacteria, particularly here is um, a dangerous bacteria, E. coli. You don't really want to have that uh, or on your food or in yourself. Uh, and the genome size of it is around 5.5 uh, million characters, 5.5 million bases. And 
uh, we are actually in the middle of things, let's say, and the human genome is around 2.2 uh, billion bases. So when you look at it, so you might be seeing a trend here, I guess. Uh, so you come from viral genome, bacteria, and then the human. So the question is like, as the genome size increases, maybe uh, again, the organism perhaps becomes more intelligent, perhaps, right? Maybe more complex, more, uh, is a, maybe it's becoming smarter. So that observation is not correct because next we have onion and after the onions are not smarter than us. Uh, although they have uh, 16 billion bases in their genome and uh, the other types of plant genomes can even be larger for many reasons, for evolutionary reasons, uh, so on. But again, this shows the complexity of the problem. So we don't necessarily analyze the human genomes, right? We analyze other genomes, which can be much larger than the human genome as well. But this means that the analysis that we're doing, should, it should be scalable to, to, to many other genomes. So this is essentially how the pairs of uh, chromosomes look like in a human uh, genome. Again, as I said, uh, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 20, 22 of them are autosomes, meaning non-sex related chromosomes. Uh, and one pair is coming from one parent, the other one is coming from another. And when you look closely, this is like uh, the famous shape of the uh, uh, spiral shape of the DNA. So these are basically the bases, right? These are the nucleotides that I'm talking about. In one strand, we have 3.2 billion, uh, many of them in a human genome when you think about the entire chromosome. And here the colors are showing you which nuclear type or which base this is like. For example, this is adenine, and next to it, there's a condition that it should be thymine and so on. Uh, so if you've almost taken that uh, biological course in your high school, so you already know, know these. But again, in reality, this is how they look like. Similar, maybe pretty similar to what I've shown previous in the animation. Uh, but again, this is how a single chromosome uh, looks like here. And then how the DNA is really uh, useful for us, right? How this is used in living organism and how this is essentially controlling things, how this thing makes uh, complex, uh, uh, let's say, uh, living structures, right? So when you think about it, so I like to make this uh, the analogy of uh, essentially coming from source code, right? And then how this is translated and how it is executed in the machine. So I'm going to use the technology. So you can think of DNA as a source code. Right? So it includes some functions, some, uh, let's say, useful stuff, but also maybe not so useful stuff, like in the code, like it has comments or like some other stuff that is not really executed later on, right? But maybe they are useful for some other things. Then what happens is that that DNA is then transcribed into a uh, thing that is called uh, RNA. So this RNA is coming from mainly the useful part of that uh, uh, DNA. Uh, like uh, exactly similar to how uh, the, your source code will be, let's say, translated into, compiled into uh, 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 assembly or a binary code, right? Uh, it's not going to use the useful part over here. And then this RNA is translated into the protein, which is doing the actual function, which is doing the actual execution, right? Which uh, uh, essentially control things in your cells and then uh, the other signaling. And this is similar to how, I guess, like how you would execute your, uh, your assembly in a certain uh, machine. Uh, so since DNA, uh, is really the meaning of things, and then it really is in the core of 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 uh, all living cells, and it's really useful for understanding, let's say, the symptoms and the diseases and so on. Uh, we really want to analyze it, right? The, the, the DNA itself. We really want to analyze the genome also, and there are certain ways of uh, analyzing it. For example, we may want to detect uh, certain genetic variants between individuals. For example, SNPs. So these SNPs are like single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a, let's say, a single character, single base change in your DNA compared to all other population, let's say. And that even a single change in your DNA can cause a disease, let's say, even that single mutation. So how people do such an analysis, an example, you might have a control group, right? 
uh, where you say, okay, these people are not showing that particular symptom, so, so this will be my control group. And then you may also have another group with that particular uh, symptom. And then you, what you will do is that you generate the sequencing data from everyone and then try to look for uh, mutations that are mainly seen in that particular group, but not seen uh, in, the, in the control group. And if you see some significance, right, certain mutations, certain SNPs, you might say that particular SNP is really likely to be seen when you have a particular uh, uh, symptom. Then you can associate that SNP with that symptom and then say, if you have that SNP, if you have that mutation, then you're likely to have that particular disease. And why is this useful? Because people are building dictionaries, people are building databases based on that information. What you can do is you can get your genome sequenced and then uh, have your, all your mutations listed compared to a certain population, right? Then you can look at, literally by visiting this website, you can look at when you have a particular mutation at a certain position of your genome, you can see what sort of symptom, what sort of uh, 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 phenotype you might have, to, just simply due to that mutation in your in your genome. Uh, so this is open source. You can get your genome sequence and then see uh, by by yourself as well. Uh, we also have uh, not just like a small mutations, of course. We also have much larger uh, variations, mutations in our genomes, and these cause even uh, uh, more complex, let's say, uh, symptoms or diseases such as autism. Uh, schizophrenia, obesity, or, or being underweight, and so on. Uh, these essentially, these uh, let's say symptoms are associated by scientific papers are associated by uh, with uh, larger changes in your in your genome. Let's say if you have them, then you're likely to have maybe these symptoms. And uh, this is the paper essentially describing uh, this phenomena. Then essentially, like we talked about intelligent data analysis as well, and then uh, talked about the genome analysis and so on. So then. I guess we can ask the question, like, does intelligent genome analysis really matter? I guess uh, we're, since we're having this lecture today, the answer is obviously yes, because I'm going to talk about it. Uh, but again, I'm going to show you before uh, why it is important and uh, what are the metrics to it, right? So with intelligent genome analysis, what we really want is first fast analysis, right? Uh, we want to answer some questions, critical questions quickly, without before, uh, they turn into more dangerous, let's say, uh, situations. Uh, we want to make the analysis large scale, right? If the solution is applicable to a um, smaller problem, it should also be applicable to the larger one. We of course want to make our analysis accurate. We don't really want to make such unsensitive analysis inaccurate, right? Uh, and also we want to use intelligent architectures, right? We want to use the right architecture uh, 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 for, for particular analysis type. And of course, DNA is a very valuable asset, so this means that you want to protect the privacy of that data when doing the analysis. So I'm going to talk about, and then we show, like we summarize all of these uh, concerns, metrics in that paper, and I show all the steps actually in, in the common genome analysis pipeline and what are the modern links and so on in this paper, so you can go and, and check the paper. But let's see uh, what we mean by fast genome analysis, right? So fast genome analysis could mean and uh, doing the analysis in essentially in near seconds using limited computational resources, for example, your personal computer or your mobile phone, right? So you might want to use your mobile phone and do some genome analysis if it was possible, right? It's not possible today, to my knowledge, at least that efficiently. Uh, but, uh, one example to it is basically doing rapid whole genome analysis, right? So that we can uh, uh, so this has certain impacts. So the goal of it is to really uh, is to make the genome analysis faster, right? It's, it's as simple as this. But the impacts of it is essentially it reduces the hospital stay length up to a certain percentage, and also it reduces the costs uh, up to from few hundred thousands to few uh, million uh, US dollars. So it's really critical, essentially. To uh, if you can have an analysis faster, then the impact of it, right? The cost. Uh, the, the, uh, the side costs, the side cost that you're reducing is really uh, significant over there. Uh, it is, of course, if you can do it fast enough, then you can do rapid surveillance uh, of outbreaks. For example, we already know that the DNA analysis is used 
to, uh, for uh, understanding certain uh, outbreaks such as uh, Zika virus, uh, COVID, and also Ebola uh, 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 virus as well. So these there are uh, papers associated to it. So if you're interested in these, you can check these papers. They are here and also the links are, the titles are over there as well. So we can check essentially how genome analysis is used for uh, rapid surveillance analysis. And the other metric was large scale analysis, right? So we, we may want to ask what organisms are present in a human environment and how abundant they are, right? So these organisms can be dangerous to you, right? And if you could see them quickly, then you could take actions quickly before they turn into, let's say, um, let's say, uh, again, optics, maybe. Uh, the other uh, way of looking at large scale analysis is population scale genomics, right? Uh, uh, here's a case study over there. So, uh, this paper essentially aims to characterize the genomic brains of almost uh, 50,000 uh, 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 individuals in Iceland. And what we realized is that it took uh, essentially around uh, 4.15 million CPRs, right? So, depend regardless of like how many thousand that you might have, unless you have 4 million uh, CPU cores, uh, so this will take uh, a really long time to, to, to analyze, right? So, making this analysis faster, this means that it can enable population scale genomics uh, even faster and uh, uh, more sensitive, even right. And understanding the population scale genomics is, is has also other impacts uh, uh, in the in the genomics area. Uh, so accurate analysis uh, again, like I'm not going to really talk about it because it should be, uh, uh, I guess, trivial, relatively trivial. So we 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 using this genome analysis uh, applications. To make usually make life critical decisions, right, or make very sensitive decisions, and to improve the quality of life. So this means that you don't really want to make inaccurate analysis, I guess. So the analysis that you're making should be very accurate. But I'm going to show you a counter uh, argument uh, as to what happens if your analysis is inaccurate. Let's say. Uh, so you might have heard the plague uh, 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 epidemic or the disease, right? So it's also referred to as Black Death. Uh, a few hundred years ago, uh, um, so so this so what happens essentially in the in the previous years is that in when doing a population scale uh, 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 genomics uh, based on the analysis, the people thought that the black death or the plague is is back again in a certain uh, environment. So this caused certain concerns in the population, but this turned out to be incorrect. So this was uh, essentially, this was referred to as the failure of bioinformatics at, at the time. So when you make an inaccurate analysis, so this can in turn into uh, basically uh, uh, some anxiety in the population as well. So you don't really want to do, uh, so this kind of is also one of the least scenario, the most maybe a serious scenario that you don't really want to do. Uh, 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 inaccurate analysis for such sensitive uh, data. And of course, we want to use uh, uh, intelligent architectures and we want to reliability when using intelligent architectures because we want to do genome analysis not just on uh, certain environments like on Earth, but people also do uh, sequencing and analysis on in the space and also on Mars. Uh, so this means that the architecture should be, let's say, reliable and uh, sufficient for the environment that you're uh, doing the analysis. So my question is really, so we have, let's say, uh, uh, heterogeneous really systems, like, uh, let's say, different architectures and designs. And the question is, uh, depending on your application and then depending on your data, in this case, it's a sequencing machine that generates the genomic data, uh, which essentially architecture, which hardware should be used so that we can achieve our goal. So our goal can be, again, doing faster analysis, accurate analysis, or efficient analysis. Or you might even want to use, let's say, a mobile device. And then this is essentially a sequencer that you can attach to a mobile device. But the model already is uh, relatively different. Right? You, you want to do this analysis in an energy efficient way, in a faster way. So what are the goals and what, what are the, let's say, possible architectures to build uh, such an important application is, is, 
is what makes the uh, intelligent architecture uh, uh, metric so important. So the last uh, point was the privacy. So as I said, the DNA is a Google, Google asset to protect. And you might have heard about this 23andMe uh, leak recently. And this essentially even like caused the stock price of that company to plummet right to into 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 pennies from a few, uh, I guess several uh, US dollars. However, um, even more important than the stock price is essentially the information that was leaked, right? So since such a data is really important, so maybe I can give information about uh, 23 and me does or did previously. It's essentially ask for your genomic uh, sample, right? You sent them your genomic sample and then they analyze and then they show you some insights about your, let's say, ancestry and then the other uh, related information about uh, related to your genome. Uh, however, that data essentially was still in their database. So when this is leaked, and this means that other, let's say, individuals uh, uh, with bad in intentions can also, let's say, analyze their DNA. So what potential impacts can it have? So you might think of maybe the future, uh, 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 let's say, uh, impacts. For example, you might want to get some health insurance, but the health insurance might have already known that if you are likely to have cancer at a certain age, so they may want to, let's say, not give you that uh, uh, the, the cancer package in your, let's say, uh, the healthcare, right? Because they might already know the information that you don't know uh, about you. So you know, this is even not the most evil scenario, but you can see how sensitive. Uh, uh, that data is and how uh, uh, important uh, uh, that leakage is for those individuals who share the data with them. And of course, there are certain privacy preserving uh, uh, ways of doing it so that even that the data is leaked, it's not vulnerable by individuals. And suppose there are companies that are promising that, but of course, you never know. Uh, so that's why basically uh, all this analysis and a past test cable and a curator is really important for, again, as I said, a very uh, uh, many reasons. And again, applications are really only limited by imagination. For example, genome editing, which can now essentially pinpoint a certain location in your genome and then change it, right? So that if you maybe, again, uh, same example, you might like you to have a certain type of cancer, but if you, let's say, change that mutation in your DNA, maybe you're going to be less likely to have it. Or you might want to have a certain phenotype, right? And maybe you go ahead and then change the corresponding region in the DNA, and then maybe you have that phenotype now. Of course, the scaling problem is also over there. There are certain challenges, but that's the premise of genome editing. And since this is very promising, people who met this very let's say, in 2012, I guess, in 2011, uh, the Dr. Nobel Prize in 2020. This is uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and uh, Jennifer Bautna. And also, people write DNA to run the computation, right? So they literally use the DNA itself uh, to generate some information out of it. For example, they solve very hard problems on those NPR problems, such as the traveling salesman problem, by somehow designing the DNA in a way that they connect each other in a certain way, such that if they connect in that certain way, they are giving an answer that you're looking for. And they design it accordingly, such that, for example, the traveling salesman problem perhaps can be solved. So it's really clear if you, if you see it that way. And again, maybe there are even other applications that we cannot think of now that they will be enabled in the future. Uh, so then the real question is how I'm going to enable fast, accurate, cheap, privacy preserving, and exercise secure analysis of genomic data, right? And this has been essentially a dream of software, let's say, since almost 2007. And the goal was to essentially come up with an embedded device that can perform a comprehensive genome analysis in real time, maybe within a minute. Uh, like to answer these important questions like uh, where the DNA is coming from in your genome, whether essentially you should prescribe a certain drug to that individual, and so on. So if you can answer these questions in real time, then the essentially the impact of it is really, really huge. Because now, if you can think of the ways that, uh, that we're going to answer only, uh, let's say, uh, a portion of these questions, 
is essentially really a simple base of doing it, right? So you take the blood sample and then you set sort of marker state, and then if you see that marker is getting attention to that your blood, then you will see, okay, we have that marker and so on. But this is not really my fine level of doing analysis. And if you could do it, you know, fine level, which is essentially what genome analysis is doing, then you might reveal many, many other things that we cannot reveal now. Uh, so to achieve this, uh, we essentially look at the entire stack of computer architecture, starting from almost the problem part, down to the devices. And in this paper, uh, we uh, essentially uh, um, uh, the, the main issue of main model makes today in genome analysis. So if you are interested in, you can take a, a look at this paper. This was a paper at back last year. Uh, but again, what we see really is that uh, the the devices that produce the genomic data, they come a long way and they are improving really in a fast way. But how we compute this type of data is not really improving in the same way, in the same pace, let's say. However, there is a bright future for intelligent genome analysis. Right? We see that and then we really want to uh, uh, catch up with the data analysis, data generation speed, so that we can uh, make the analysis much faster and much more accurate. Uh, so I'll go over the, uh, is essentially the genome analysis steps, like step by step, uh, relatively uh, quickly, and then we'll take a break afterwards. Uh, then I'll uh, show some examples of, from our group how we essentially accelerate or how we design other uh, system, let's say, to 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 solve some challenges. So how we start with genome analysis in real life today is it starts with sample collection. So it might be your blood, it might be your saliva, so on. So now what we do is that we somehow uh, prepare it in a in a in a lab, let's say environment. Uh, so there is a, so it's basically prepared in some liquid environment uh, so that your DNA is amplified and so on. So you create many copies of your DNA. Uh, there is the, this is referred to as lab preparation step. But then what happens is later on you put that uh, uh, library or um, a liquid in the sequencing machine. So this is the sequencing machine. And how the sequencing machines uh, uh, work is essentially they work on, not on the entire piece of your genome, but essentially the broken pieces of DNA for several reasons that I'm gonna touch upon later. But then what they do is that they digitize that DNA, which is a biological data, let's say, and they, they turn them, they translate them into the digital form. And the initial form of them is usually in the raw uh, way, which can be a set of images, which can be a series of electrical signals, depending on how they are working on, how they are converting this DNA. But then later on, what we do is that we convert them into ACTGs, let's say, and then do our analysis. And then I'm interested in these computation steps over there, and then uh, uh, we don't look at these steps much, let's say, for now. So this is how the entire pipeline looks in genome analysis. So you can see there are many steps uh, over here. Uh, so I'll start with the, the, the one uh, where we uh, generate the data from the biological molecules, let's say, which is this, right? Assume that this is your uh, uh, library that you prepared, that you put in a single uh, sequencing machine, and the output will be this, basically. Uh, Essentially, the limitation is that there is no machine that can take your entire genome, right, as one piece, and then uh, it, it can give the complete sequence of genomes as output again in one piece. So you get some fragments from your genome. But again, to reach up, the goal of DNA sequencing is to find the complete sequence of ACTGs of your genome in an organism. And the challenge is there is no machine that can give you as one piece, rather, you have the random. Uh, fragments from DNA because they chop the DNA into pieces uh, uh, and then give them as, as output. So in a sense that DNA sequence is a chopper. You start with a, uh, let's say, relatively uh, a single piece and then this is chopped and then this is the digital form of these uh, choppings that we refer to as reads. So these are fragments from your DNA. And then these are the steps in analysis. So you start with, again, these fragments, these reads, and then what you do is that you look at essentially, uh, 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 let's say, previously constructed genome, for example, human genome, and then try to identify where these are coming from, and then you identify what the mutations are. 
But again, uh, this is still a costly process. Even for a single individual, it can take a few hours and then a few thousand uh, US dollars, perhaps. Uh, but the real takeaway is that we have many small randomized fragments from the original DNA, so that's what we want to analyze. And we have uh, several different sequencing technologies. Right? So we have Oxford Nanopore technologies. They will also vary in size. Uh, we have Pipaya Illumina, so Pipaya itself can be I don't know, as large as this, this part of the room, right, that uh, the, the projective part, or that particular device here is, can, be, can fit in your palm, so you can even hand out that device. So the sizes really vary a lot. Uh, so, so does the trade-offs, let's say, and also their prices. So they may run, let's say, in, within a few hours or maybe, uh, maybe longer than a few days, and then the, the amount of data that they can generate also changes and so on. Um, so we we'll continuously look at essentially these uh, new uh, technologies in sequencing technologies, uh, and one particular technology that we're looking at is called nanopore sequencing technology. And then we look at the challenges uh, the, the also what's ahead with this technology. So the, the, this paper nicely summarizes uh, the current steps and the challenges in analyzing that, uh, the data that they generated from that particular machine. However, uh, uh, this machine is particularly interesting because that's currently the only portable uh, sequencer that you can have. What you can literally have is that, uh, imagine this is the sequencer. This is literally the same as, size as this one. Maybe this one is smaller. And what you can do is that you can carry it around with you and then connect it to your uh, computer, let's say. And if you have your sample already prepared, you can do a genome analysis on the way, right? So, and the applications are really uh, tremendous for that, right? So, uh, uh, if you assume, let's say, you're hiking and then you wonder whether that particular mushroom that you just saw is dangerous or not, right? Because maybe on the way, you just sequence it and then get the answer rather than taking the picture of it and then asking it uh, for the for the app. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, as I said, the different of sequencing, different machines generate different of sequencing data, there is on how they work, right? And of course, they have different trade offs depending on how long the, the data reads are, right? Uh, or the, the size of the, the length of the reads change depending on technology and also how accurate they are. Uh, they can be inaccurate, again, depending on the technology. Uh, so, I'll quickly show uh, uh, how micro sequencing works, uh, let's say, um, so that you can have a basic understanding at this, how this biological uh, data uh, is transformed into the, let's say, uh, into the digital uh, uh, form of it. So, as I said, micro sequencing is uh, one of the common use sequencing technology out there, and it can produce relatively large fragments of DNA, up to 2 million genomic bases, and some there are some unique features to it. For example, it enables real-time analysis as well, as well as being portable, let's say. And this is how it works uh, in real time. So this is uh, the monopole sequencer has uh, uh, essentially here uh, many channels, many pores like this. So we call these pores or nanopores, and this is how the name, where the name is coming from. Uh, so we have many of these. And in each channel or each pore, what's happening is that there is a DNA, essentially. And you can assume there is a three-layer solution here. So the top layer is negatively charged, and the bottom layer is positively charged. And in the middle, we have a membrane where the, this particular nanopore, which is a protein, uh, on top of it is, is attached. Right? So what's happening is literally, since DNA is also negatively charged, so what's happening is that it's actually moving from negatively charged side to the positively charged side. But this is literally what's happening over there. So as it moves through uh, from, the, from this side to this side, it essentially creates some disruption over here as it moves. So these disruptions are essentially measured. Those ionic current uh, uh, changes are measured in real time as DNA passes through the nanopore at a certain speed, right? So there is a particular speed that thing moves through. And these measurements are then reported, basically, as a raw electrical signals. And we know that these changes are significant enough for us to tell whether there's an A 
that we're seeing at the prime or T or G or C, basically. This is how we're telling by looking at these uh, raw signals. And one like what we can do is that when you have this electrical signal, then later what we can do is we can use, for example, a machine learning technique to translate that electrical signal into a uh, into basis, into ACTG, so that you can do your analysis. Or you can even do, if your analysis is uh, efficient enough, you can even do real-time analysis. So what this means is that we get this data in real time, not basically uh, after this DNA is sequenced fully, but you get it real time. So what this means is that if you can match the throughput of data generation uh, while analyzing it, so you can do real time analysis. So what, what's the benefit of it? The benefit of it is essentially you can tell, you can give feedback to the sequencer as you analyze it as well. The impact of that is, for example, you you uh, want to analyze your own genome. Let's say you collect the sample. Uh, from your own skin, and then you want to analyze your own genome, and then you put it in the sequence. But it might so happen that that might be a bacterial a viral genome as well in the region that you collected your sample. But you're not really interested in, let's say, sequencing that viral genome or bacterial genome. So what we can do is that doing analysis, if you can realize that the particular DNA that you're sequencing is not coming from a human genome, you can tell the sequencer to stop sequencing that particular DNA so if you can tell it in real time, it will stop sequencing it. So this means that you can actually save a lot from the sequencing time also and cost, because this means that you can, uh, you don't waste essentially uh, uh, by uh, unnecessary sequencing. So uh, uh, we actually explore these benefits in this paper that we call OHASH. And if you are interested in this direction, you can uh, check this paper. And we, of course, uh, 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 more on this direction and then in previous earlier work. So, this is another paper. Uh, also, make some algorithmic changes so that the analysis is more accurate. This is another paper in that direction as well. And also, we look at the ways how we mass call essentially use ML techniques to translate the signals into the basis. And then still do, let's say, almost real time analysis with uh, AI ML approaches as well. And this is really, let's say, relatively low cost because you can get a single flow cell. This is a consumable, right? So, we, and with a single flow cell, you can sequence almost three individuals, right? Uh, once. And uh, so, this means that you spend around $300 US dollars for each individual and then uh, get your whole genome analyzed. Uh, with that amount. So compared to other technologies, this is relatively uh, low cost for a whole uh, human genome analysis. Uh, uh, but the further uh, information is essentially uh, these raw signal data is not necessarily containing only the ACTG information, but also containing more information about the genomics. So this paper actually looks at this direction and then shows actually there's more information to, to raw signal data and we're interested in uh, looking at these directions as well. So I'm not going to describe how Illumina machines work due to the timing reasons. So I'll just skip this, but maybe on the way I can just tell you what happens is that we uh, attach synthetically designed, let's say, bases in the DNA. And then once they're attached to their corresponding location, they emit a certain light. And then as they emit that light, you can imagine that there is an optical sensor taking pictures as they emit that light. And the, the frequency of that light will essentially reveal the information about that base at the time. And then this is how Illumina machines are working also uh, in real time. Uh, there's a virtual tool, so you can check as well how this thing works. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, uh, so we have fragmented data, and we need to construct the entire genome from many sequences, from many uh, uh, fragments. And for that, the sequence comparison is really essential in the genome analysis. We want to analyze the sequences by accurately and quickly comparing them. So you can. So I like to have this puzzle analogy here. So you can assume these are the biological sequences, right? So these are the fragments of your DNA that are sequenced, right? And the goal is essentially to solve a puzzle somehow. And then you can do this analysis by comparing these puzzles to each other so that you can see how they match together, right? So that you can see what's going on here. So what this individual looks like. Or 
That could also be a template sequence, maybe representative of a certain species that we call a reference genome. Remember the human genome that we talked before. So you can look at that template sequence and then try to see how, how and where this particular uh, uh, fragment uh, match into in that template sequence. And then you can do your analysis according as well. But again, this is really essential to understand the functionality of a sequence, mutations and diseases and so on. And again, this is a similar puzzle analogy to show the trade-off between different sequencing technologies. So in Illumina, uh, we have relatively uh, 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 small pieces. So the question can be like, which sequencing technology are we going to pick, right? And uh, so what we have over there is that we have, for Illumina, we have relatively smaller pieces. So this means that it is relatively more challenging to solve the puzzle problem, right? compared to the one that when you have larger pieces when solving the puzzle. And with, for larger pieces, you go with uh, non-offer sequencing or essentially quick bio. But the benefit of Illumina is usually it has a fewer error rate uh, as opposed to the long read sequencing technologies, they have relatively high error rates in the data that they are generating. Meaning, okay, you may construct the puzzle relatively easily, but the puzzle that you construct might be nature, let's say, compared to the original one. So, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, quickly describe how we are essentially analyzing uh, how we are matching or making that uh, sequence comparison uh, efficiently. So, it's really like um, um, uh, sequence comparison in genomics is really like solving rights puzzle from sequencing output, and then we call it read mapping. Uh, so, the goal over there, uh, we have many short DNA fragments, or we call reads. Uh, to our non different genome, uh, 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 maybe some differences are allowed, right? Because not every individual is exactly the same as the other one. So this is basically how DNA logically looks like. We have two strands. This is how physically looks like. So this is what you get from sequencing machine. And this is your reference genome. And this is what you really want to do, right? You want to map each fragment to their corresponding uh, uh, position. So that we can understand uh, where they are coming from. But this is really challenging because we have billions of poses, millions of characters. So we have many regions to check, right? And the way of doing it would be imagine you have your reference genome, which is maybe relatively long, and you have your root. And another way of would be looking at every position one by one and then doing some approximate string matching for every position. But this is, of course, very, really, very really expensive and it's not really scalable, right? And there is essentially a practical way of doing it, of course. So this is, again, our reference genome. This is our root. And for human reference genome, you can imagine this can be a 3 billion long uh, 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 character, uh, right? So we usually start by constructing a hash table. And this hash table contains basically k which are essentially which is which are essentially referred as also kilograms and and also substrings, right? These are k long subsequences, right, from the from the reference genome. So we store in each of these subsequences, depending on your selection criteria, in the hash table as keys and also their positions where they appear, right, in the hash table. So what you can really do is that you can ask this hash table whether it has particular k or particular subsequence immediately, right? And then you can get also the corresponding positions of that subsequence in the reference genome uh, relatively quickly. But this is uh, what the uh, indexing is providing us. And this is usually an offline step. This is a one time task that you do it for each reference genome and you use it many times later on. And then later, when you want to map this read, meaning when you want to learn by this thing belongs to in this entire reference genome. What you do is that again, you extract k from this read, and then you query these k right, in the hash table, so that you can determine whether these k exist, and if so, where they are, right, in the reference genome. So this is called CD. Uh, and then you identify these matching regions, right, in the reference genome, and then later we can realize that some regions are not very informative, right? So it's called so then you may want to filter them out, right, by some computation because maybe it's just like a wrong match because like of the short uh, subsequences and so on. But then maybe there is only a single piece that's remaining that's really informative. 
then data what we do is that we look at this position, the region, and then read, and then try to identify the exact differences one by one between this region and then the read by doing some approximate string matching. So this is basically how the usual uh, read mapping steps look like in, in four steps. But then the selection of KMIs to store and query significantly impacts, of course, the accuracy, storage, and requirements, and performance because it makes it impacts the content of this hash table, uh, how you select these KMIs from both reference genome and the read. And there are ways of doing it. So one way, imagine this is your reference genome. You might you could simply use all KMIs from that reference genome. And what I mean by is that you imagine all fixed length subsequences from the reference genome, all overlapping, meaning you have this and then you shift by one character right and then you generate the other fixed length subsequence and then you go on like this, right? So this, uh, these are called overlapping KMIs of length seven. So what you can do then later you generate some hash values from those and then store or use hash table uh, to query. So this, the next part is basically there's high sensitivity because you don't lose much information here. But of course, it uh, incurs a uh, lot storage requirements because you're storing redundant data. There are other techniques, for example, sampling techniques that you don't store everything, but just one of them. So what is the selection criteria? You hash and then you take the minimum one among these. And then there is a theoretical paper behind it uh, showing taking the minimum one is actually meaningful uh, for similarity detection purposes. And benefit is, of course, it reduces the storage requirements, although reduces the sensitivity a bit as well. And there are mechanisms also that enables you to, let's say, generate the same hash value, although these KMIs are not exactly matching, but rather they are highly similar, right? So this can be useful to, for, for downstream analysis as well. Why do they ensure that they will still generate a different hash value if these, let's say, subsequences are uh, largely different than each other. But it's really useful for finding some novel regions in the genome that you cannot find with regular uh, hashing techniques. And uh, there is a paper behind it. If you are curious, uh, you can uh, take a look at it. Uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> there are really certain challenges in root mapping. Uh, uh, you need to find, uh, there's a basic, there's a need to find uh, new mappings, right, of each root. Uh, we usually find mainly candidate regions, mainly regions in the reference genome. So then this means that how can we actually uh, uh, find these regions, find these uh, locations in the reference genome efficiently? Using cache table is one more of it. There are other techniques to do it. Uh, we also need to there can be differences between the individual and the reference genome because not everyone is exactly the same. As I said, we should tolerate this. Uh, and of course, all of these operations should be uh, uh, should provide higher performance and so on. So then, when we look at uh, essentially the, the execution time of the entire root mapping, uh, what we see is that so this is the filtering step. So this is you can assume this is the seeding step and this is the alignment step, which is finding the exact differences. So what we see is that. Uh, uh, the, essentially, around 60% of the read mapper's execution time in, in the alignment, uh, along with also this to the chaining part. Uh, so, to remind you again, the alignment was the step four in the, the previous uh, uh, slides that I showed you. And what this really finds is essentially approximate string matching, and it finds the minimum edit distance between a pair of sequences. So, here an edit distance would give you basically the minimum number of edit operations, and these edit operations are maybe a substitution, insertion, or deletion, the minimum number of edit operations that you can do to make one string identical to another one. So if you can get this number, then this means that this is your edit distance. And if you, if you can have this number, you can also have some similarity estimation between a pair of sequences. However, this is, uh, a challenging computation to do so because it's uh, usually done by dynamic programming approaches, so it incurs, it incurs quadratic time, uh, complexity, and the universal limited data dependency, uh, and the, the limited uh, parallelism because of the data dependency. And um, uh, also, usually the entire metrics should be computed, almost the entire metrics should be computed in alignment so that you can identify the uh, the edits. And there's basically a theoretical paper behind 
to showing that this is uh, uh, indeed a challenging uh, 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 computational task uh, to solve. Uh, we also have this survey paper, it's around uh, 100, almost 100 pages, that looks at all these techniques in read mapping. So you can take a look at it uh, to see uh, essentially how far we've, we've, we've come since 1980s, 1970, uh, until, until today. And this is again, uh, this paper shows uh, again an overview of the steps that we're doing. Uh, uh, from the moment that you collect the sample to the moment that you get your answer in genome analysis. Again, the other question is, you might not have the template sequence that representative of the genome every time, right? So what, if, uh, what happens when you don't have a reference genome, right? You can still do the analysis, basically. And how you do it is essentially, as I showed you previously in the puzzle graph, you get these reads, right, the fragments, uh, from a sequencing machine, what you do is that you compare them to each other to find overlaps between them. And then, essentially, they, they, you don't know which stand they are coming from. You also take the reverse complements. But what you do is that uh, you do some cleaning because some information may be redundant, and then you link them together somehow. And this is, and then after you take the consensus, maybe this can reveal the genome itself again after uh, pairwise comparison. Uh, but again, this is like uh, usually done by graph approaches, and this is not really as simple. This usually looks ugly uh, to parse, let's say, to, to, to the genome itself. Uh, the other question is, should we really rely on a single reference genome, right? Because the uh, uh, individuals, of course, show differences in their genome as well. So the template sequence itself is how good uh, is, is, is essential to represent the entire population, uh, right? So currently what we do is that you have this human genome, right? It has, it determines many phenotypes, of course, and then the reads are like, have certain lengths, right? And then their origins and locations are unknown. So what we do is that we construct them by looking at the single reference genome. But again, it might so happen that the individual that you're looking at, you're analyzing, might be so different than the reference genome that you're using. It might have large variations, large variants in that particular uh, uh, individual. Meaning, so you might still be able to map certain pieces uh, in, uh, by looking at this reference genome. Right? So some rates can be mapped still because we still tolerate certain differences. But if the differences are really too large, so these fragments might fail to be mapped, let's say, to that reference genome. And this is referred as the reference bias. This is basically due to the re reference that you're using. And there are solutions to it. And one solution is, of course, okay, then let's not use one reference genome, but use the N genomes, right? Maybe in this case, use four reference genomes. And then map, them, map each of them one by one. But this is not really, let's say, relatively a clever solution, right? You just... I don't know, uh, increase our uh, complexity or the, the computational cost by n times as well by just doing it. But the second solution is essentially is to use graphs uh, to uh, 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 essentially uh, 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 show the differences between individuals while if there are certain regions in the genome that are constant, maybe they can be, uh, uh, um, they can be uh, represented as a single piece of information. So this is usually how it looks like. So you, you might have a graph, and a certain parts of the genome may not be exactly the same across many individuals. So you don't really want to have redundant information there, but there can be some certain regions that are really changing uh, depending on the individual, right? So then this means that you might have branches in your graph showing, uh, focusing on these changes in, in the population. And if you could represent this efficiently, somehow, then maybe you could do your analysis also efficiently. And this is usually how it is done, right? So we use a graph to, to do it. And if there are changes at certain part, your graph diverges into different paths, and then we do your analysis based on graphs accordingly. Um, so basically, uh, one fundamental question is, for example, can we be able to the entire genome uh, uh, once, uh, right, as a one piece. And if that happens, what will happen, I guess, in terms of the analysis, maybe it will render some of these previous uh, computation steps um, unnecessary. 
But the last step is usually all of them written up in information that you generate, right? You know now where your reads map to in the FS genome. So what you really want to generate is that knowing this information, uh, given this information, then tell me the mutations that that particular individual uh, might have. And uh, so what you can do is that you can get a consensus, like right? this is the maybe my way of doing it. You can get a consensus by looking at all these mapping to that mapping that same region, and then see what the consensus is telling you, right? Uh, and then then you can tell okay, there is if if the consensus is different than what the reference genome is saying, then you have a mutation over there. But the question is basically, you might have these differences due to either mutation or maybe sequencing error or some other reasons as well. Uh, and the challenge is really figure out to identify the different type of, uh, let's say, variations that you can have. So you can have like uh, single changes or small insertions or deletions or really large changes uh, in your genome. And there are many ways of analyzing these, identifying these changes. Again, I showed you one way of doing it, maybe majority voting, but maybe it's not really a great way of doing it because it doesn't really handle some probabilistic behaviors of, of certain changes that you can have. And the other way is somehow using, including these posterior probabilities, let's say, uh, in the analysis by using maybe hidden Markov modes, perhaps, that particular SNP is not really a SNP, but a sequencing error and so on. So there are techniques that are you give them, uh, uh, the, the, the information and then uh, as an output, it will tell you uh, whether essentially this is really a mutation or not, depending on the, the, the hidden Markov model output. Um, so this, this idea has been used in a popular uh, uh, tool that identified mutations uh, and uh, so basically, you can take a look at this too if you want to learn more about how this variant color works. Uh, people also use the uh, uh, machine learning techniques to identify mutations. For example, they represent a uh, mapping information as a set of images, right? Maybe differences, uh, the other, let's say, information that we have in read mapping, and then represent that as images, and then use this image to identify whether there is a mutation or not compared to reference genome. Uh, so this is used in deep variant, and it has been uh, proven uh, as both accurate and also uh, faster compared to the previous uh, state of the art work. Uh, so these are like how structural variations look like. So in the simple terms, like different types of mutations, such as deletion, insertions, maybe even inversions, duplications, and so on, but in a large scale, let's say. Uh, so identifying these is also uh, important, but I'm not going to talk about these uh, again. Uh, so maybe now it's a good time to have a five-minute break so that you can get the uh, share so that I can stop talking about our uh, works that we do. It was a bit warm, I guess, right? Is, uh, it's very you think you can keep it open, or yeah, I think so. But I think she's closed it because some people were walking. I see, yeah, I, I see, yeah. Oh, if you are with yeah, yeah, let's yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, that will be good. Oh, okay, so you can.
can so maybe we can uh, i don't know how this angle is fine i guess so the goal is not uh, not necessarily to record the screen i guess but you have to have a probably a good angle in the camera right of me i assume Are you coming over there? And I think I will. I think it looks good. Okay. 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 Then uh, let's try to cover everything else in 20 minutes. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I think this can stay open uh, for now. So what we're going to do in the second half of the uh, lecture is to see basically our work, let's say, uh, on how we design that algorithm and hardware together so that we accelerate these steps in, in, in genome analysis that we covered previously. Um, so yeah, uh, we essentially see significant barriers in intelligent analysis today due to many reasons, and we look at these reasons, of course. One reason is there is a performance gap between data generation and data processing. This is what we've covered anyways uh, so far, right? So these are the steps in genome analysis starts with data generation, goes down to the discovery from, let's say, the end column which identifies mutations in your genome. So we look at each of these steps one by one. So what we realize is that the data generation part is really fast uh, uh, compared to most cases more steps in the analysis part of that data, right? So you can see the, the data speed, the generation speed is a few gigabits per hour, although the analysis step is uh, substantially slower than the, the generation speed. Uh, generation speed. So again, then we talked reason for it as well, but we're now just showing the numbers why this is the case, essentially, right? So there's a really fast machine that can generate the data in a very fast way, but we're analyzing it uh, in a in a in a inefficient way. The other bottleneck is the barrier that we're seeing is the, the data moment that we're having in this analysis is very expensive in most cases. The reason for that is in in again in most scenario, of course, this data is generated and then it's stored somewhere usually in the SSD. And it needs to move through, of course, as usual, from memory to the microprocessor, CPUs, and so on. Uh, so basically, there is a huge amount of data moment here. And as we come over so previously, even a single memory request consumes a uh, uh, few hundreds or orders of magnitude more energy compared to uh, performing the simple operation stuff. So the goal is how can we really reduce this unnecessary data moment, right? So because for certain applications, it really better makes the, uh, uh, the performance and also the, the energy consumption uh, in genomics as well. It's not really... The only case for other applications that we looked at before, but it's also important for genomics. And essentially, the reason for that is the data analysis is performed uh, far away from data, right? We need to move it uh, to to the to the CPU, to main memory, so that uh, we can analyze it. So I like, look at the, uh, uh, the the computing system, right? The Richard Feynman's. Uh, you might know uh, is essentially famous saying that there's a plenty of room at the bottom, but there's also a plenty of room at the top as well. So this means that we need to look at both the problem and the devices at the same time so that we can uh, 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 leverage the power of hardware software core design to accelerate these important applications whilst making them energy efficient. 
So to achieve this, we need, of course, intelligent algorithms and intelligent architectures that especially handles data well, right? So that's one uh, almost requirement over here when we're designing these. So as an example, like we have this uh, particular case here. This is like a simple matrix uh, uh, computation that you might already know how this is uh, performed. So I'll close this for now. Yeah. So essentially, uh, if you compute this uh, in different platforms, including different uh, uh, programming languages, but also using, uh, let's say, uh, specialized, uh, relatively specialized way of computing things, what we really see is that the runtime of that such a simple computation can change significantly. So the way that you're computing things and how you're computing things, it's really zero uh, dramatically affects essentially how much time and energy you're spending, even for that simple uh, computation. So this means that you should really know how to compute things uh, to make it faster and, 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 and efficient. And we do this also for uh, genome analysis, of course. We look at uh, different steps in genome analysis, as I described earlier, indexing, filtering, alignment, and so on. And we design uh, algorithms and as well as architectures uh, 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 to make them faster and efficient. So these, these are some examples from our group that, that uh, essentially exploits uh, the hardware software core design and uh, to... Uh, to uh, uh, more efficient and accurate uh, genome analysis. So we're going to look at uh, some of these uh, now. So we know that the sequence alignment is expensive, computationally complex as well, because of the dynamic uh, programming nature of it. So the goal is essentially uh, we want to reduce the amount of time uh, that we are doing alignment. So we don't really want to do the alignment unnecessarily, and we want to really do it when it is necessary. So the Key idea to achieve this is usually when you have these genomic sequences, strings, right? So when you, you have uh, the pairs that are similar to it, right, in the definition, or also some pairs that are dissimilar, but still you might end up uh, uh, doing alignment there. So usually it so happens that there are many more computations going on here when you're doing the alignment between the sequence and the dissimilar regions in the reference genome, right? So in most cases, you have your, your small percentage of your candidate regions in the reference genome are going to end up being aligned or being similar to what you're looking to, uh, while the large portion of it will be dissimilar. So this means that when you're doing alignment here, you are wasting your compute cycles and your energy, right? So you don't really want to do it. So if we could eliminate this, if you could somehow ignore this, uh, then you could uh, accelerate uh, the time and also improve the, reduce the energy that you're spending significantly. So the, uh, then essentially the idea to it is you figure out the regions that are that can be similar, but you don't know still if it is similar or not. Like you use the hash table, let's say you got the matches, but you haven't performed the alignment yet. These are the step. The next step would be the, the alignment on these regions, right? And then you apply to do the alignment and then figure out whether they are similar or not. But the key idea is in between those, if you can insert uh, efficient filter, right? That really determines um, whether that particular uh, 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 region in the reference genome is similar, really similar, that is worth for real alignment or not, right? If you can have such a filter and the combination of it, if, it, if the combination of this thing is essentially faster than just doing these two steps, then uh, the filtering idea can, can work here, right? So there are certain conditions to it, right? Uh, you want to filter out, if not all, but most of the inaccurate in the similar regions, but in the, at the same time, we want to preserve the correct ones, right? We don't want to filter out the ones that are really similar, right? So we want to keep them because these will be aligned in this step. And then, of course, we want to do it quickly so that all these steps are faster than doing all these three steps are faster than doing these two steps, basically. And this is what Gatekeeper is doing. Uh, uh, is basically... Um, 
is a, a pre-alignment filter that inserts that filter before alignment. And the key essentially the uh, observation is that if essentially two strings differ by E changes or E edits, uh, then basically uh, uh, you can align or you can uh, uh, align these sequences by performing at most two E many shifts, right? So I'll show you how this thing works. Uh, this is basically based on an idea that's called shifted hamming distance. And by following this shifting idea, it provides significant, uh, uh, or, or, let's say, using a, a, an efficient, let's say, or high performing hardware, it provides significant performance improvements up to 130x uh, compared to the previous state of the art. So this is essentially how it works. So let's start with two strings, right? Uh, so here uh, you have uh, the uh, on identical strings to each other, right? So meaning yeah, eight matches, but uh, zero mismatches. But if you let's say don't have this A in the middle, so what you would have originally, ideally, you have only one deletion, right? The minimum edit operation that is needed to make these strings identical to each other. But if you were to do Hamming distance between them without knowing this edit operation, what we would get is essentially uh, uh, the, the five mismatches over there, although in reality you have only one, right, over here. So essentially, if you want to really, this is basically known as the effect of deletion, right? Everything gets shifted left. And if you want to cancel this effect, you want to shift right, right? So that's, that's the idea. And this is basically how we do it. You have this string, but then you have another version of it that is shifted by one, right? So you do your classic uh, uh, I mean, distance operations, both on this string and also on this string. And then this is basically the numbers are generated by the exit operations. And if you have ones, then this means is, is, uh, is the particle region is uh, not matching. Then what you do is that you end all of these to figure out whether you have a series of zeros, right? If you have a series of zeros, then this means that you actually have uh, matching regions. But for that particular region with one, then both, both of your masks, let's say both of your versions, agree that there, there is an edit over here. Because even though you shift it, and without shifting, you see an edit. So this means that, and you right shift it, then there should be a deletion over here. So this is more or less the idea behind uh, shifting and, and how this thing uh, works. Uh, but of course, like we don't we don't necessarily we don't know uh, essentially why these deletions are and how many deletions we have, right? And whether we have uh, even uh, insertions uh, or deletions, right? And to that, we generate masks, meaning we generate the same version of the same sequence shifting n many times to right and also to left to look for both insertions and deletions, and then you do the same operation that I just told you, that I just showed you previously, and then you look at the ones and zeros to figure out how many edits uh, you have here, and then basically you figure out uh, uh, essentially the, the, the edit operations, and then when you compare it to the optimal alignment using the DP approach, you observe that what you, the information that you get is uh, almost identical with the DP approach. So it's a pretty good estimation of uh, the edit between sequences without using, let's say, this dynamic programming approach. So this means that since all of these masks can be computed and uh, compared independently, so this means that you can achieve high parallelism here, and this means that you can use right hardware with bitwise operations, maybe an FPGA, right, is a, is a right hardware over there, to perform all of these operations quite fast. So if you can do this quite fast and eliminate the unnecessary operations that would be computed here, right? You're not just adding additional operation here, right? You're reducing lots of operations here, meaning in total, the combinations of these two becoming much smaller than what this thing would be originally. So this is how things are getting accelerated with the right uh, hardware software core design. So this is how we essentially uh, generate, uh, achieve high performance improvements and also energy improvements and so on. And this is based on the shifting, shifting running distance idea. You can take a look at the target works, and this is the gatekeeper paper. And of course, we look into the better ways of doing it. Uh, for example, Sneaky Snake is another example 
Uh, again, it tackles uh, the similar problem, but in, to make it more sensitive and also scalable. So I think uh, programming alignment, like in the alignment to goal is really to figure out uh, uh, the, this sequence of non-overlapping regions that have matches, right? So when you look at this diagonal, if you see a long uh, matches, so this means that is a, is a nice match that you see between sequences. So we want to really figure out these in the alignment. Uh, so this is really similar to uh, basically a um, single net routing problem uh, as well. So this is essentially you get a signal and then you figure out the route that the signal will be outputted in the chip. And uh, there are essentially algorithms to solve that. And the similar problem essentially is reduced to the, uh, the uh, genetic similarity calculation as well. And this is how it is done. So similar to Gatekeeper, we construct these uh, essentially masks that we do based on uh, basically uh, shiftings and so on. But rather now what we do is that we start with a uh, 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 more shifting uh, mask and then we start from here and then as we see one over here, basically as long as we don't see a block, uh, we continue from all actual unblocked regions. So we don't necessarily start from here, we start from all unblocked regions, all ones, right? Uh, but you essentially take your path as long as you uh, uh, you don't see a block. So once you see a block, you're going to parallelize your computation, then you look into the ways that you can continue your path by counting how many blocks that you, uh, uh, you've seen along the way, right? By doing so, you can essentially estimate how many blocks that you achieved, but still you reach the exit before, let's say, reaching to the limit of edits or blocks that you should have to say that this particular sequence is similar to another one, right? So if you uh, experience, basically, if you see many blocks, then this means that you don't really do computation anymore. You can stop in the middle. So uh, meaning the, these sequences are, are not going to be similar to each other. And um, again, this is this the way, this way of computation is uh, is much efficient uh, than the uh, gatekeeper and the earlier works, and also much more accurate. Uh, and this essentially. How essentially using the existing algorithm, existing solution to the other problem again? How can how it can be helpful? Is is another example of of this thing. Again, I showed you the data, the problem related data moment. Uh, uh, essentially, the goal is that we need to design a mapping and figure, uh, filtering algorithms that also fit the processing in memory or in flash uh, uh, processing as well because we don't really want to move the data unnecessarily. So we, uh, if you're curious, you can take a look at this uh, lecture uh, on, on uh, processing using memory. You can see how we essentially perform computations within the memory itself so that you don't have to move the data. And there are many other resources that you can uh, check. Uh, so yeah, this is about uh, Sneaky Snake, and this was uh, implemented, if I remember correctly, on an, an an FPGA with an HPM uh, uh, memory, and uh, uh, with the HPM memory as well, there is uh, the, with, with fast memory access, there is also benefits to it, and there are insights related to it. Uh, using new memory techniques, basically, we also use uh, computation. So we is a green filter again as filtering idea, but designed differently. Uh, so what we really do is that we create bit vectors. For each region, it's, it's certain regions in the reference genome, and these bit vectors will tell you whether it has a particular camera or not within that region in the reference genome. So this bit vector can be basically stored and then later used when the reads are coming in, and then you can query each bit vector basically and then tell, ask uh, whether um, uh, uh, that read and that particular bit vector in the reference genome shares a certain amount of k-mers. And it shares a certain amount of k-mers, then you can say, okay, that read belongs to that particular region in the genome because uh, there are a certain number of k-mer matches in the genome. Uh, so, both of the two are really simple operations. It's highly parallel because uh, there are many, many bit vectors that you can compute at a time. And this is how it is designed. Right? So, this is a 3D stack. Uh, 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 DRAM uh, layer, so you have many layers of DRAM, and at the bottom you have a logic layer. So here the TSVs bring the data relatively quickly to the logic layer from 
let's say, uh, 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 different layers of DRAM. And then once this data is, is, is brought to the near uh, logic layer, you can compute it relatively quicker, right? Because these are located near the uh, DRAM layers. And the, then how we design the problem is basically you have, you put each bit vector in, into, into the, um, into the columns, basically each row uh, in the in the bank in the in is represented as a different camera is encoded as a different camera, and since you can just tell whether a camera exists or not by zeros and ones, you can literally use these uh, uh, the arrows of rows here uh, to to store the information of bit vectors uh, for each bit in the reference genome. So then you can bring up that data and then do your computation whether. Uh, you have these cameras or not in this bit vector, and then uh, figure out whether that read is similar or not. But the yeah. idea is really essentially how you work the data, right? We should know how uh, we should know the limitations of the hardware, the requirements of the hardware, and we should know essentially we should design the algorithm also accordingly, such that you can load your data and access your data efficiently, and so that you can perform your computation efficiently. As and this is. Uh, basically, how the uh, hardware algorithm uh, design looks like in, in this case. And uh, Jeremy is the first author of this paper, is presenting uh, here at AACBB, I guess. Uh, and uh, you can watch this if you are interested in that. Um, we have uh, many other works that I won't be able to cover, uh, but I want to quickly uh, go over them without uh, showing you the details. So, we also uh, uh, look at the approximate steam etching problem, which is the core of uh, uh, the alignment. Uh, and then we essentially try to accelerate the approximate steam etching with, let's say, simple bitwise operations and then designing maybe uh, everything attached to HPM so that we can also get the data quickly. And this is actually how it looks like maybe without the HPM. And there are a few different parts of that uh, the design while in some part we use historic areas for efficient, let's say, uh, streamlining of data because that's, let's say, the requirement for that step in genism. And the, the essentially the other part, it performs, uh, reduces the problem into a simple bitwise comparisons. And then these bitwise comparisons are done efficiently here uh, without uh, requiring a large area, let's say. And, uh, and, uh, and then essentially when we move, like, what sort of data will be needed uh, that you can actually put that data near these accelerators using, for example, HPM, and then it's like, then it really looks like it's a two birds uh, with a two, with a single, uh, with a one stone, right? And then uh, you both reduce the data moment uh, uh, latency as well as you perform computation fast at the same time, so you, you accelerate uh, uh, both steps in this in this uh, particular analysis. So it provides, of course, uh, uh, significant speed ups and energy improvements as well. Uh, we improve things also uh, on top of the existing work, which is uh, built on top of genism. It makes both algorithmic improvements and also architecture improvements on top of genism. So I'm not going to cover these, but you can uh, go ahead and check this. And we also use, let's say, certain instincts, in, intrinsics uh, in our pre previous works in our uh, uh, next projects. For example, uh, uh, a big chunk of genism has been used in Segram as well, and Segram is really, let's say, uh, not necessarily just an approximate stimulation algorithm, but it focuses on on the on the graph uh, problem of genomics, and there you also have uh, a sequence uh, similarity computation in the uh, in the in the graph analysis in the graph genomics as well. So we realize that we can actually use a large a uh, chunk of genism in Cerebrum as well, and this is uh, what we essentially did is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is, uh, if can be seen here. Let's see if you have another figure. No, unfortunately not. So we have essentially, here the trace part, part over there is, for example, is, is mainly come from uh, the genism as well. Uh, but of course, we make addition so that that previous algorithm can work efficiently for the problem that we're targeting. And then so we make essentially uh, nice changes to the algorithm so that the, the problem works with the graphs because the graphs have different requirements uh, in, in that particular application that we're dealing. 
And this is uh, Damon's talk, who is a first author of Segram. So if you want to learn more about Segram and learn how genome analysis in graphs uh, look like, uh, looks like you can take a look at this video. So this is Segram. Uh, so Jester is, is focusing on in flash or uh, 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 in SSD, let's say, uh, computation uh, for genomics. So the problem that uh, Jester is dealing is we accelerate essentially uh, uh, the genome analysis by looking at how we uh, basically looking at the ways that we compute data. So we accelerate these. Uh, so initially we have computational overhead and data moment overhead, but when we accelerate these things, so the computational overhead might have resolved, but the data moment overhead is still there because you need to still move the data from storage system to your accelerator, let's say, and that overhead still remains. So the idea is that can we actually do some part of the analysis within the storage system uh, so that it doesn't need to be moved from your storage system to your accelerator or to your CPU, right? So what are these operations, basically? That's the question to ask for, right? So we that we can use SSDs to perform certain computations, but the real insightful question is essentially, what are these operations for that particular application? And can we map them to that hardware? And we figure out what operations uh, we can perform and how they can be useful. And then we show them, actually, if you do these operations, in genome analysis in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the SST, uh, then we can gain actually significant uh, benefits for reducing the data moment uh, latency and also the energy that we're spending. So this is Jan's talk. Uh, so Jan Pip, this is focusing on uh, sequencing data, using processing in memory. Uh, so this is, these are the steps in raw signal analysis, right? We translate them into ACTGs from raw signal. But there are basically many steps. The story that this is telling is the data is moving a lot, basically, between different steps to, to get the final answer. Right? So there is, and the data is actually getting reduced. So you're not really utilizing all the data that you're generating in, in the beginning as well. So the goal is actually, if you're not going to end up uh, using all the data that we generated initially, and if we are moving out of data unnecessarily, can we actually minimize it? So we do some basically uh, motivation analysis, like what would happen if we didn't have any data movement and if we didn't have any useless reads. So we would gain like, essentially around 9x improvements compared to using, let's say, existing pin books, right? They also reduce the data moment latency. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, we design uh, jump it. So what jump it is doing, it creates a channel, let's say, between two steps in genome analysis, between base calling and heat mapping. Base calling is translating the electrical signal into bases, and heat mapping is figuring out why these bases belong to in the reference genome. So what it may so happen that you don't need all the data here in this step, because in this step, some of the data can get useless. So here, what jump it is, is uh, creating the coordination between these two steps within the run. So it is coordinating the data nicely. So like, I'm not really gonna talk about this design, but what this does is that it coordinates the data nicely such that the chunks of data is only sent. A small amount of data is sent, and then the feedback is always sent back uh, to the controller to decide whether the base calling should continue or not. And so that we can reduce the amount of data generation here and the data computation over there. And then we all do this in, in using fully in PIM and uh, again, achieve significant improvements in terms of uh, performance and uh, energy. And there are essentially uh, applications that we tackle like in algorithmically and in architecture way, but I'm not gonna really talk about this. So if you are really curious, I would suggest you to take a look at that. Again, this is, an example of how raw hash works that I mentioned previously. These are the benefits of real-time analysis and the challenges also, right? Uh, and the key idea of raw hash is to somehow do the signal analysis efficiently, knowing uh, the challenges. So if you can do the analysis in real time, you can send feedback again in real time to the device and so on, and this is really beneficial. So if you are curious about how we do real-time analysis, in genome analysis, you can take a look at raw hash and our other works, uh, raw line and, and, and so on. Okay, so to conclude, um, uh, so we uh, already showed you some of our own works in adoption of hardware accelerators in genome analysis, and this has been a dream uh, for many years. 
and we see that essentially uh, final things are happening in the industry as well. So with We've covered enough, for example, Illumina is building its own FPGA, uh, let's say, infrastructure to perform some of these computations, computation, expensive computations uh, in their own, let's say, uh, ecosystem. So they are now realizing the importance of, let's say, uh, using the heterogeneous system to perform efficient computations. So this is also a nice example of like how relatively uh, simple or nice ideas can turn into money, let's say. Uh, so this is an example from um, a startup in 2018 by a few undergrads. So they've designed this GP implementation that can perform a certain operation and genomics extremely fast compared to the, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the state of the art way of doing it. And uh, and maybe I realized essentially the, the, uh, the opportunity over there and then they brought up this startup uh, relatively quickly. So you can even uh, uh, gain a few millions of US dollars by simply solving important problems over there. And again, India is not really stopping there. So they are actually uh, providing the necessary support and their GPUs to, uh, to perform critical operations that are common in many applications, such as uh, these uh, DPX inst instructions that are uh, really efficient for Python dynamic programming uh, 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 calculations, right? which is again in the core of alignment in, in genomic analysis. And uh, industries, companies, and genomics, such as Biomimo, is also collaborating with the, 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 the tech uh, companies like in the NVIDIA, right? so to essentially build the hardware uh, for the right data so that this particular data is analyzed uh, efficiently. Uh, but again, company is still bottlenecked by the data moment, and the adaption is needed uh, to reduce the data moment. Uh, uh, and this, the, the essentially, uh, uh, there are requirements and challenges to do it, uh, uh, but essentially this is needed to make the, the, the high impact. Uh, again, this is one of the still open questions because it's a big question, right? So you cannot maybe achieve everything at once, but going forward, of what will be achieved. And of course, there is no single answer to it, right? I showed you before, there is no single right architecture for a single type of data because the applications are changing. So depending on the application as well, you might want to pick the right uh, architecture. So for example, if your genomics application is demanding lots of AI and our operations, so you might want to use the corresponding hardware. So this is a serverless uh, microscale engine, which includes uh, trillions of transistors for uh, and all operations, let's say, right? So this is a newer version of it. And um, again, I mentioned to you about the FPG implementation, FPG uh, infrastructure of Illumina for fast analysis. And also we are part of, uh, of our, uh, uh, as a, let's say, project of funding called Biopim. And uh, this is basically a collaboration of uh, many, let's say, uh, institutes and, and, and also many companies, including uh, uh, essentially, IBM, also several institutes at France, ETH, uh, also in at Israel, Turkey, and so on. And this is essentially to uh, come up with these algorithms and also the pin design so that we can achieve this this basic level dream that I showed you earlier, like where we can come up with uh, the 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 single embedded design that can analyze the genomic data efficiently and accurately. And there are already uh, uh, commercially available. Uh, processing in uh, the uh, 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 modules, right? You can literally uh, buy them off the shelf and then uh, uh, hopefully use them and uh, to, to perform your computations. Uh, so yeah, uh, to conclude, system design for bioinformatics is of course a critical problem. It has many, many essential implications. Uh, and this lecture was about exciting a key step in bioinformatics, mostly genome analysis, genome sequence analysis, especially techniques for heat mapping. And we also covered various ideas to exercise genome analysis. And of course, many future opportunities exist uh, 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 to, to solve more important uh, problems, for example, especially with new sequencing technologies and new applications and, and use cases. So you can take a look at these sources or textbooks to learn more about this topic. So I'll just show them to you, but these slides are already available on the course page. We also have workshops 
uh, towards that uh, to to have a nice discussion about uh, these topics. So you can take a look at all of these and uh, get informed in, in a more detail. And also we have uh, PNS uh, courses that we offer projects to, to undergrad students. If you want to work on a particular project in genomics, you can register that course. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, CS department can register, but uh, we can check. And uh, yeah, so these are other uh, links, basically. Um, yeah, with that, I guess this is the end of the lecture. Like we're already 15 minutes, uh, I guess, exceeding the time. But maybe I can take questions if there are any. Although it was a very intense lecture, I guess. <laughs> okay, then. I guess thanks, everyone. Thanks for your attention.